Welcome to this installment of BSO Backstage, a concert preview. Uh, we're here at Sweet Sally's and taking in some delicious coffee. And I'm here, of course, with Dan Alcon and Laura Clemens with uh, Brian Symphony Orchestra. Thanks for joining me. It's great to be here. It's a nice day to be inside drinking coffee. You get a shot of the windows. It's all steamed up and fogged up out there. It's kind of a drizzly winter. Winter is back. Winter is definitely back. And with also Sweet Sally's having their hours be later nowadays, you can come here even at night when you're trying to get some uh, warmth and studying going on. Um, so tell us about how your November concert went. I, I understand there was a, it was a lot of fun. It was a great, great concert with Greg Danner's piece playing and then also with an education. So tell us a little bit about how the concert went. It was another showstopper, just like October with, with the Beethoven. The Rhapsody in Blue was huge. Talk about a crowd pleaser. Everybody was so happy. Um, and then we followed it up uh, with our annual education concerts. This year we had 1,400 kids, fourth graders, coming in for um, three back-to-back -back concerts. Um, the, um, the first two shows were for the Putnam County kids. There were about 800 of them. Then we had 600 kids coming in from McMinnville um, this year for the second time, actually, um, which is we think is particularly fitting since our namesake, Charles Faulkner Bryan, grew up in McMinnville. Um, and these kids are always so excited to see some, one of the hometown guys. It was really exciting, too, the, the November concert, particularly because our soloist arrived. Um, that was a fun thing that, that Michael Chertoff, who was the soloist, is a great pianist. He's been here before and uh, an old friend of mine um, played in Rhapsody in Blue in Ottawa, Canada the night before uh, on Saturday night. And so that was fun. I was begging people to like send me text to let me know when he was in the country because he had to leave. He had to be at the airport at four o'clock in the morning, you know, because it was an international flight. And I was trying to get text messages. Nobody was texting. And then I get a text message that at lunchtime, yeah, we're here at o Charlie's eating in Cookville. I was like, okay, I'm glad uh, that you're here. And uh, Michael came in and he and I did a quick rehearsal over lunch and he was just fantastic. Everything we knew he would be, he's a great guy. And he loves coming to Cookville. That's a really neat thing that we um, frequently have soloists to come back uh, without a, se a second thought about it because they really enjoy playing here. Um, they enjoy seeing the audience. And we had a great dinner with Michael after the concert with some of the sponsors. and. Um, it was just a really successful concert, and I was really excited that my colleague, Greg Danner, um, that we got to do his piece. Um, that was really impactful for the whole audience, as narrated by Mark Creeder, but also especially for the young uh, people, uh, for the fourth graders, to be in touch with a little bit of our, our past. Um, and that past is getting further in the distance. I think that those kids probably have great grandparents who were involved in World War II, many of them. And so um, this is a really neat opportunity to honor those. And also to, you know, to have the kids from McMinnville here is always fun. Um, we did that for the first time last year and then uh, this year to have them here again. And, and, and it's really neat. We feel that's kind of honoring a little bit of our heritage with Charles Bryan being from McMinnville. So talk a little bit about the heritage. Um, so the namesake, Bryan, and then also this being the Founders concert that's coming up. Uh, give people that maybe have just tuned into the show for the first time a little insight on the beginnings. Well, it's really um, about, to me, it's about the importance of opportunities for young people because Charles Bryan was from McMinnville, Tennessee, and uh, he was really the first big legitimate classical composer from Tennessee. And it, there are other musicians from McMinnville who um, became famous. None of them were classical musicians. In fact, one of them you know, kind of teased him as they were getting into their 20s. Is like, you got to go with this country music. This is where the this is where the money's going to be. And Charles Bryan, his parents recognized a talent in him and made great efforts. In fact, through the Depression era, they made great efforts for him to go to special schools in Nashville, and because they recognized that he had a talent that was unique. And, and I think it was just really neat. He went on to go to graduate school at Yale and studied with a very famous, the, probably the most famous teacher immigrant um, from Germany. His name was Paul Hindemith. And um, Brian went up there and he kind of felt a little intimidated by all these Northeasterners, you know. And uh, he felt, you know, he's like a little bit of a, you know, kind of boy from the hills of Tennessee. And Hindemith really encouraged him. And in fact, he encouraged him to stay with his traditional source music. A lot of Brian's music has the music of Tennessee and of the South as source music. In fact, the, on this next concert, we're playing an overture from his opera that he wrote in 1952. It was an opera called Singin' Billy, and it was a, it was a tale set in the South about a traveling uh, songbook salesman. 
And um, so we're going to perform the overture for that uh, at this concert. It's one of the pieces that I kind of, um, last year we did a uh, Charles Bryan centennial celebration honoring the 100th anniversary of his birth. And it's one of the pieces that I kind of reconstituted out of the archives, um, which exists at Tennessee Tech. So the University Orchestra played it last year. We're going to play it uh, on the Bryan Symphony concert this year. And this semester, I'm actually on a non-instructional assignment. I have a research um, uh, semester to go in and further recompile the, the archive, the Bryan archive that Tennessee Tech has, because it's, it's been archived for research purposes, but it has not been put together for performance purposes. So my job is to go through these eight to 10 boxes of pages and leaves of music and also go over to Nashville where there's some more uh, in the Vanderbilt Library and to put things together for, for more future performances. So I'm very excited about that. In fact, the big focus of my project is this opera, Sing and Billy. I really hope that I can put the whole thing back together in new score and music and um, that in a couple years we'll see a performance of it. And do students get to experience some of that? Um, I know that with the education component of the concert, do you go into the history of music, the history of composing, and maybe, you know, that this is an opportunity for them to maybe study that when they get to school? Laura can tell you a little bit about how we did that actually through the web this year. The education concerts always come with material um, that, uh, that the kids can study. Um, the most important material over the past two years probably actually was produced by WCTE and that was our instrument primer um, DVD that the kids use. But on our website we also include links to um, the biographies on the composers and the, the songs themselves that the kids are going are gonna to see. Um, I love, McMinnville is always really good about um, asking the children to write essays um, after each concert. And last year, we haven't seen this year's es essays yet, but last year's essays, um, some of the kids were talking about how inspired they were, just knowing that, that one of their guys turned out to be such a, such a, a talented and kind of famous for his time, not as famous as he could have been probably because he died young, but, but famous for his time, and how inspiring that was. One of the, one of the little girls actually wrote, you know, I hope that one day maybe I can be with the Bryan Symphony Orchestra and maybe I can conduct the Bryan Symphony Orchestra yeah, too. Yeah, no, I have a replacement waiting in the wings now. There's a little girl out there who's determined to take my place, which is great. Um, and that's really important. That's an important message for um, teachers and parents and young people is that um, talent really, I always say this, talent knows no geographical boundaries. And really it's about opportunity. The sad thing is when we don't give young people the opportunity to um, experience a broad education, and especially in their early years, it's hard for them to find what really is, is their calling. And we need people in our society to be doing all kinds of things. And so um, it's really important to have that. So I, I think it's very inspiring. And we frequently get that. And we encourage the kids when we do instrument demonstrations and stuff that, you know, this could be you. Uh, up here, and that's why it's particularly important that WCTE helped us make that uh, demonstration video on the instruments because I wanted it would have been easy just to provide links to here's a bassoon player, you know, you know there there are links out there, but I wanted you know the bassoon player that they're going to see on stage that day that they may see in the grocery store, so that they know that it's someone from their community. And in our case, Jim Lotz is like six feet eight, so they would recognize <laughs> that the bassoon player, that is definitely the guy I saw on stage, and he's buying lettuce right there, I see him. Um, so it's important for me that they know these are people in their community. And are there other community uh, members that are supporting projects like this, or uh, some of the programs that you bring? Well, we have a great partnership with our school system that's incredibly important because we make this a curricular part of their, their education. It's not a field trip. Um, uh, per se, but that's why we try to provide these materials and coordinate with them and, uh, and provide this concert and we're meeting state standards. We go through and we look at the state standards that we're meeting for these things. Um, and then we have a lot of people, we have so many volunteers that help with this concert. Um, it takes a lot to, 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 to do this and Laura has to coordinate all that. I'm worried about the stuff on stage that she gets to do with. <laughs> with uh, 30 to 40 school buses pulling up one after the other in front of the Bryan Fine Arts Building. It's a, it's a sight. It's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, getting 1,400 kids yeah. <laughs> in and out of the auditorium in three hours is... No, oh, their teachers are, are awesome, though. Yeah. The teachers are like, hop yeah. to it. You yeah. know, it's, it's great. We're also always looking for supporters on the financial end of these education concerts. We once had a lot of good corporate support on that, and that's, that's kind of gone away. Um, and one of the ways that we try to attract it back right now is by reminding people that if the children don't see this stuff live, 
they're not going to be as interested in it. And we hope that our education concerts actually let the kids not only see it live, especially the kids who are seeing it for the first time, and hopefully it won't be the last time. What Laura is trying to say in a delicate way <laughs> is that we started doing the education concerts. I think in my second year, we yep. revived the, they'd been done you know, several years ago, 20 years ago, 15 years ago. We revived them in my second year here. We had good corporate support. You know, times were a little bit better economically, and then we lost some of that support. We decided to eat the cost because it's so important to us, um, and we have the comfort of a, of a pretty good you know, buffer in the bank uh, long term, but we need that support again, and we know that there are people out there who, as times are getting better and business is uh, picking up, that we'll have those partners come in again, and we need that support to be able to justify uh, our doing this concert, but we're not letting it go away. I'd rather just, I'd rather eat the cost a little bit and, and just have it do it, because we're, it's important for us to provide this for our school system. And speaking of cool, uh, school systems, we traveled to McMinnville to talk to a historian who is also one of your board members. Uh, how did that transpire, that, that connection? Bill Zekman came looking for us. Bill Zekman um, is, has studied Brian his, his entire life, I believe. Brian's widow, Edith, was actually one of his English teachers in high school. And his Sunday school teacher. And his Sunday school, yes. that's right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bill um, has, again, he's made Brian the study, his life study. Um, and he had been coming to our concerts, I think, in the, in the past, yeah. And he volunteered to be on our board, and we were very happy to have him. He's, um, he's, he's just pretty much energetic. Sick. He he's, is a great cheerleader mm -hmm. for Charles Bryan, but also mm -hmm. for the kids in McMinnville. Yes. I mean, Bill yes. really is the one who basically told the, the community of McMinnville, we are supporting this. Uh, this venture, we're getting our kids to this concert. I mean, he and he has a great team of people, and we really appreciate everybody in McMinnville's help and, and bringing, getting the kids here. And the first time was very difficult. You know, anytime you do something new, you're inventing a new process. But this year, it went very smoothly, and the community really gets it. And when they saw, I think, especially the Rotary Group uh, saw the responses from their children that saw the concert last year, it was really impactful. So that was really neat. But yeah, Bill has kind of pushed me into my study of Charles Bryan. Um, and it's a natural thing because if, if I'm not going to help revive these works and put them together, who is? I mean, I have the archive here. I work at Tennessee Tech, but it takes time. And so I'm really excited that I was part of a competitive um, process to get a, a what's called a non-instructional assignment this semester. It's a research uh, semester so that I can get into these works because I don't want them languishing. And a lot of these old uh, works are, are written on this kind of onion skin paper that was made it easy to copy. And they're slowly starting to degrade and crumble. So it's, it's time. It's time to get this done. So. And if not, as who? Yeah, right. Yeah. Charles Bryan was obviously a, a huge part of the community in McMinnville, uh, as well as here in Cookville with the Bryan Fine Arts Building being named after him at the at Tennessee Tech. Uh, and also inside we have the Watsonberger Auditorium. Um, you know, talk to us a little bit some, about some of the upcoming concerts and sponsors and supporters of the... We have so many friends. We have, for the November concert, we had six people who have sponsored concerts for us in uh, 20 years, I think some of them were. And we also have some friends sponsoring the upcoming concert, the February concert, uh, Robert and Julia Lowe, who have been a part of our family almost 50 years. I, I hate to say that and date them, but it's been a long time. And also First Tennessee Foundation, um, who both, both the Lowe's and the foundation are really helping make February possible. This year, you know, is our 50th anniversary, and it's an anniversary is always the perfect time to stop and assess. Look where you're going, of course, but also look where you've been and on whose shoulders you stand. Um, Charles Bryan was certainly a part of that. It's interesting, he's our namesake, and yet the connection with him is tenuous. We, re you know, he was Tennessee's most famous composer for a while, and he also kept the music program at Tennessee Tech alive during the Depression. He was here for five years, um, and if it were not for him, who knows what the music program would have been like. He, he kept it going in those days. One of our founders, though, um, for whom the February concert is, is dedicated, is Jim Wattenberger, who came along, um, I guess, 30 years after, after Brian left. 
um, came back as the chairperson of the department um, and started the Bryan Symphony Orchestra, Tech Community Symphony Orchestra, as it was called then. So what we do with the February concert then, in part at least, is honor both of those men. We honor we honor Brian by playing overture to to uh, Sing and Billy and. We talk about Jim Wattenberger, for, without whom we would definitely not be possible. And I know, when did Jim Wattenberger leave? Because I'm, I'm understanding you didn't get a chance to he meet retired, him. He um, retired, oh gosh, has it been 20 years? Yeah, Probably. 88. Yeah. He and he, but he died more recently. I didn't meet him, but I was able to meet his family at the uh, funeral, and I played my cello actually uh, at his uh, funeral. And it's, you know, it's fun to look back and see the footsteps in, in which you know, I kind of travel. You know, I think that Charles Bryan was, there are people, when I moved to Cookville uh, 10 years ago, there were people, uh, and still are people, who studied with Mr. Bryan in the music department and helped me learn about his legacy. And then, you know, that legacy lived on until there were, we were basically, the department was ready to found the symphony orchestra. And a lot of those people who felt that was important, again, were people who had been influenced. Um, so it was just about footsteps, you know, um, that, uh, the 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 Dairy Berry family's footsteps, the Wattenberger family's footsteps, the Bryan family's footsteps, and I kind of see that. And, and as I'm looking forward now to the next 50 years of me conducting the Bryan Symphony, um, you know, it's it's fun to to have that um, that responsibility on my shoulders. I mean, I really do feel that, and it's fun actually to kind of plan and think. When we think we're doing things that you know, I try to do things out of the box or do a big project, I think well. You know, how audacious was it in 1962 to say, let's have a professional, you know, uh, symphony orchestra uh, play in Cookville. So um, it kind of is encouraging in that way, and I'm, I'm excited about that. So, um, and the music on the February concert is, um, we have some connections to our, some of our recent past, too, because we're bringing back a soloist who was here for my first concert. Um, when I first came here, I really wanted to make sure that part of what we were doing is bringing in people, other people into the community that um, would have an impact. So at that time, there was a young cellist that I knew who was commuting between San Francisco and Germany. He had two jobs, but he was a guy that I knew in, in when I was in graduate school. And he came and he played on our first, my first concert here. He played Schumann Concerto. Then about six years later, I had, he came back and played uh, Shostakovich Cello Concerto. And at that time, I said, Mark, I would really love you to come back in our 50th anniversary year and play the granddaddy of all cello concertos, which is written by Anton Dvorak. And he said, I'll do it, for sure, I'll do that. It'll be great, we'll have a good time doing that. And then a couple years after that, I got an email from him and he said, hey, I wanna give you my new address in Cleveland. And I knew that the Cleveland Orchestra was, had been looking for a new principal cellist. And I thought, oh my goodness, no. And so Mark, I thought immediately, I thought he's not gonna be able to come back to Cookville, you know, because Cleveland is really one of the best orchestras in the world. Um, not everybody knows, but it's my favorite string section in the entire world. When I hear recordings, the Cleveland Orchestra is it. And Mark sits there in the front. And so I talked to him and he said, oh, I'm still planning on coming uh, back to Cookville. And so um, it's really gonna be exciting to have him back. Not only that, we, um, I applied for a, a university center stage grant for Mark's visit here, so he'll play a recital with his wife, who's a pianist, on Thursday night, um, and then we'll uh, see him again on Sunday. So it's kind of making his week a little bit more worthwhile to, to do those two things when he's taking some time off from his job in Cleveland. And I'm just so excited to, to uh, hear him play again, and it'll be such a uh, shot in the arm to a lot of uh, Middle Tennessee's cello players, because everybody knows who he is and it's been fun to see the arc of his uh, career. I first met him when he was a freshman at Indiana University, and I was a doctoral student at that time, and, and he came in, and he was, of, of the five orchestras at Indiana University, he sat first chair in the best orchestra as a freshman, and we all went and hid and didn't <laughs> want to play our cellos in public because Mark was so fantastic, and he's just a great guy, and um, I'm really excited to have him back in Cookville, and so excited that that uh, you know, this is part of what's nice about Cookville. People return. You know, the, the soloists they're they're happy to come back. We treat them well, and they know the impact that they have. Um, even now, I'm planning next season. And I was talking to a manager, and I said, you know, here's the thing about the Bryan Symphony in Cookville. Right now, we have we have 500 seats in our hall. We have 491 subscribers. Your artist is going to be appreciated here, <laughs> and they just they can't believe it. They, they, it's it's really a neat thing. So, uh, also on the program, we're playing a piece by Robert Schumann that um, is a piece that's one of my favorites. It's a, it's a kind of a miniature symphony. So we'll start the program with the Brian Overture and then play a three movement work by Schumann uh, called the Overture, Scherzo, and Finale. And Schumann was a great pianist and then
then became a better orchestra uh, composer after that. And this piece was written in 1841, which is one of his best years. Um, and uh, so it's just a charming piece, and it has not been played here before, except for by the University Orchestra, which we did it a couple years ago. So um, something new by a well-known composer. The Dvorak is really the most famous cello concerto there is. In fact, it was thought that really the cello was not a good solo instrument until Dvorak wrote this. And when he wrote this in the late 1890s, Brahms said, if I'd known a cello concerto would, had, could be written like that, I would have done it myself, <laughs> which is kind of funny praise. But uh, Dvorak was actually influenced to write it while he had, he had come to America to teach for three years. And he heard a uh, cello concerto that was written by Victor Herbert who is well known as a, an operetta and a kind of early pre-Broadway composer here, but was a classical composer and a cellist. And Dvorak heard a couple performances of his cello concerto and he thought, oh, this, this can work. So oh, thank goodness that Dvorak came to America and was influenced by Victor Herbert and then wrote this great piece. So with all the soloists that come to town, uh, what are some of the experiences that they get to take away when they were here in Cookville? Like, there's a couple of things going on with uh, the soloists that you have coming in. Well. The first thing that's the best thing is they love it when they drive into town and they drive by the stockyard, the people's stockyard. And they think, this is awesome. I'm coming to a very different place. Um, although Mark Kosselwer, our soloist, is from a, a rather small town in Wisconsin. He's just a, a nice Midwestern boy like me. And uh, he, but they love coming here. Frequently, uh, Mark's first visit here, we had a great dinner after the concert at someone's home. And there are people in the community that he remembers meeting um, and uh, or frequently will go to Mauricio's after the concert. And it's nice because they feel like, you know, they've been here. Sometimes we have a symphony social where they see students. Mark's going to give uh, on Thursday morning before his recital that night, there'll be a convocation for all the music students um, at Tech. And they'll come together and he'll do a couple things. One, he'll play a little bit of a preview from the recital that night to make sure the students feel enticed to go. And he'll talk a little bit about his job. I mean, Mark has reached the pinnacle of the orchestra world. Um, in his job and talk about how he got there or what it's like to play in a professional orchestra like the Cleveland Orchestra. And then we'll have some students play for him. Um, I, it's neat, I have one student who's about 18, is a high school student who um, has, this will be the third time he's played for Mark Kosowar. He's played for him here um, and then he went up to Cleveland after having met him here, he went up to Cleveland to play for him. Um, so he's, he's been able to make connections here through these several visits. Uh, that he's had to town. I was talking to some friends uh, the other day who the last time Mark was here, he was in their home. We had a symphony social at their home and they've got, they said, oh yeah, we still have the poster that he signed on our wall. We show it to everybody who comes in our house. So um, they feel at home and, and it's nice that when they've met people in, in town before the concert, you know, and I even feel this way that, you know, we come out on stage and it's a little bit of a formal atmosphere, but that's because it's a concert setting where we want everybody to enjoy it. So it's quiet and it's uh, a, a nice atmosphere. But, you know, when I like go to bow and say thank you or whatever, I see people, and it's, you know, in the front row even, I see people that I know and I think, oh, it's so neat that, you know, I'm performing with, for these people that we know. And, and the solos feel the same way that, that they really make a connection here. And when they come back, there's people that they remember um, or people who comment about having seen them before. So, and we're proud of these people, it's especially the ones we've grabbed when they're young uh, a little bit early and they, their, their careers keep going up uh, and we get them to come back. Um, Jose Franck Ballester last year, clarinet player, the second time we've had him here. So it's nice when we have a, build a relationship with them. Okay. And uh, when is the concert and how can people go about getting tickets and seeing the concert? Concert is on, um, begins at three o'clock on Sunday, February uh, 10th um, on, uh, on campus, of course. Box office number is 525-2633 if anyone wants to call about ticket availability. Um, you can also find out a lot more about the concert itself and the Bryan Symphony Orchestra itself on our website at www.bryansymphony.org. Okay. And there's also social media, uh, Facebook and we Twitter? We do. We keep people, we try to at least, keep people up to date on our, our Facebook site. Yeah. Laura does a great job of that on Sunday mornings. Frequently she'll take a picture during rehearsal and put it up and, you know, you can kind of see how things are, are uh, moving towards the concert or I, I, I think I might have even said something like, thank goodness our soloist is in this country, you know, at the last <laughs> concert. <laughs> Hopefully we'll soon be in Cookville. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for giving us an update on the upcoming concert, and we'll see you next time on BSO Backstage.